Okay, welcome everyone to Elizabeth Bay House. For many, many years, the grandest home in the colony. Now, this room that we're standing in is, is the library. And when the house was completed, this was also the largest room in the colony until the new government house was finished in 1845. So this home was built between 1835 and 1839 and built for a man called Alexander Maclay, a very proud Scotsman and a man who came over to Australia in around 1826 to become our colonial secretary. And at the time, colonial secretary was second in charge, so an incredibly important position. And he took up that position underneath Governor Ralph Darling. And the other thing about Alexander Maclay, he had an absolute passion for collecting moths and butterflies. Lepidoptera, it's called. So, he is not the type of man to go out with a net and catch his own butterflies. This is the era of gentlemen collectors, and they were in fact purchasing pre-court specimens, pre-pinned specimens, and for a while he had the largest individual collection of moths and butterflies of anyone in the world. He packs up his six unmarried daughters, he packs up his scientific collection, they sail to Australia, and he becomes very good friends with Ralph Darling when he arrives here. And he became so fond of Alexander that he in fact gifted him this land in, Ale in Elizabeth Bay to use as he wished. And the thing about that was that this land had actually been put aside for public use by Macquarie. He moves into the house in 1839 with his uh, six unmarried daughters, his wife, and his eldest son comes over here to live with him as well. William Sharp had actually been loaning money to his father for many, many years. And it got to a point in 1845, because William Sharp said, I, I cannot loan you any more money. He also takes control of his father's insect collection. William Sharp is quite a scientific mind as well, but he's kind of the next generation of scientists, sort of more around the period of Charles Darwin. He's the one that's using these insect collections to come up with new theories of evolution. He also used his father's scientific collection to write a lot of um, scientific papers that were published in journals. So we have this kind of first generation which is all about discovering these beautiful things, trying to unravel the natural world. We have this next generation who are really starting to figure out how things interact, are using those specimens to, to publish papers. So he's also important in the history of that Maclay collection and he does expand the collection as well quite a lot. He doesn't have children however and so when he dies in 1865 the house is then passed on to the next generation, his cousin, which is this gentleman over here. He's another William, unfortunately, makes it a bit confusing. He is William John Maclay. Again, another generation of scientific mind. He takes over the collection. He really expands the collection because he is of this third, very kind of intrepid explorer um, stage of, of scientific discovery. This is kind of the 1860s, the 1870s. He actually buys a, a ship, sails it up the north coast of Queensland and all the way to Papua New Guinea and collects specimens, collects Aboriginal objects and artefacts. This leads to the 1970s when we start to become aware of the importance of this house again and it was decided that the Cumberland Council would do up the property and gift it to the Lord Mayor of Sydney to be his personal residence. And again the people of Sydney felt that this really wasn't very fair. This time they, they kind of won that battle and the Historic Houses Trust was essentially for, formed to look after this property and also another property called Walkloose House in around 1980. And since that time, we have been recreating the Maclay period of occupation. So these beautiful cabinets all around the room are still filled with Maclay's collection. This is a, a prop one that we had made up a few years ago. These are all obviously real insects, but this is essentially what most of the drawers look like. Some are completely packed with insects, but a lot of them do still have these original beautiful pins, some of them dating back to the 1780s. Um, during the 1830s and 1840s there was a beautiful artist in Sydney called Conrad Martins who did a whole series of lovely watercolour portraits essentially of people's homes on the harbour. This is how the house should have looked because as you can see there is a veranda 
Here we are in the central space of the house known as the saloon and when you tilt your heads backwards and look up you get to appreciate what is the only oval dome in Australia. A very very rare architectural feature and really only one of a handful of oval domes anywhere in the world. Alexander actually had to get shipwrights in to help him make these beautiful curved windows at the top of the oval dome. Um, really one of the most exquisite features of the house for me is the joinery and the timber work. And this house was constructed by free men, it wasn't by any means built by convict labour and we have to kind of consider that in the history of New South Wales. A lot of people were really starting again over here in the colony in the 1830s. We had a huge influx of incredibly talented builders, um, uh, masons, woodworkers and really you see some exquisite work in this house. Saloons don't really have a purpose, they are essentially show-off rooms and I think even today you can see it is a show-off room. It forms the very centre of the house. The staircase itself forms this incredible ellipsis that adds a lot of drama to this room. Have a look at the top of the staircase there on the landing and follow that lovely curve all the way down and it finishes directly below. So it still forms this complete oval but look at the movement and the drama that that creates. The staircase itself is all cantilevered which means that it doesn't require any supports because it's all very carefully balanced with the, the weight of the walls and the weight of this kind of landing and the stairs itself is carried through that swirl and down into the floor so you don't need to support it in any way. And all of that lovely weight is just carried through that swirl and down into this central section. So this lovely little room here, this was their breakfast room, uh, a room used predominantly in the mornings for informal family um, dining. Um, it does catch morning sun so it does look a little bit dim in the afternoons but what I want you to notice is that this room echoes the shape of the saloon. So again we have that lovely oval shape in this room but just on a smaller scale. So the lovely um, French doors do sort of bow outwards like that in a curve. One thing I do want to point out is that even this door has been curved. All of the timber throughout the house in terms of the joinery and the doors is Australian red cedar. Um, folks, we've stepped into the drawing room and drawing rooms in the 19th century were essentially feminine spaces. Drawing room comes from the term withdraw. Ladies would withdraw from a dining room, leaving the gentlemen in a dining room to discuss all those types of topics that ladies can't possibly understand like politics and, and law and all of that sort of stuff. This is the original firepiece in here as well. This is the Italian Carrara marble firepiece that, that William Sharp brought over with him. And again, you can see some beautiful Greek details in here. This is actually the Anthemian or honeysuckle design. So this is quite a common Greek revival element. Now, as I said, the furniture that was in this room originally was brought over by William Sharp, but he had to sell it off. Um, to make a bit of money and he actually sold it off to the new government house which was being built in the early 1840s. So the suite of rosewood and mahogany furniture that he brought over is now in the government house collection and you can actually see it on display there. Along with the gold pelmets. So our gold pelmets are actually reproduction but the original gold pelmets from this house now hang in the drawing room of government house. William Sharp sold them at a 10% discount because they were second hand but he still did get quite a lot of money back. Obviously carpets do wear out so what you see is a reproduction carpet but it's quite important to note that this carpet has a white background and a white background carpet was really only used by the incredibly wealthy families because it's a display of that wealth. It's saying that I am wealthy enough, I have enough servants to keep this carpet clean. So it doesn't matter if you drop your biscuits or spill your red wine on here because hey, we can afford to have that cleaned. The thing about building the most expensive house in the colony is that you become a potential target for people breaking into your lovely house. And so this house is fitted with a series of shutters. We still use them to lock up the house at night. They still form an incredible barrier to the outside world. But as you can see, they also block out an incredible amount of light, heat, sunlight. So they are used to stop fading. They are used to keep the warmth in the house. This room is the morning room. Um, quite a lovely feminine space as well. What you might notice about the room is that it does have very, very high wainscoting or skirting board. That is an indication that this room was used for visitors as well. 
high wain scotting, showing off again. Timber was expensive. This is a way to show that you are wealthy. This room was the room that Donald Friend lived in when it was converted into flats. So this was Donald Friend's apartment. Now when it was converted into flats, this room was stripped bare, painted over, all the timber was painted over, and it came to the point in Sydney where most of the homes on the harbour were forced to follow the rules of blackout at night. He was threatening to paint the windows black because he couldn't afford these apartments, these curtains for the apartment and he still wanted to entertain at night. His sister said, don't be ridiculous, you're an artist, you need the natural light during the day. So she came over and she was poking around and looking at things and all of a sudden she knocked one of these shutters and it came out and it sort of tore the paint and came away from there and she realised that these internal shutters were here in this room and so he didn't need to buy curtains after all. They simply put in a couple of handles and they got to use these internal shutters at night. So he could continue um, having his evening events and not worry about um, anything like that. Now he did get a very incredible view of the night of the um, midget submarine attack on Sydney and he was saying that that was the reason essentially that he joined up um, to the armed forces was that you know when you have a, a first-hand experience of something like that it does really move you to action. 